Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special episode of This Year in Perfume. And the reason it's so special is we're starting to get into what I consider to be the heart and soul, the meat and potatoes of my collection, if you will. And, um, you know, uh, if you've been following the channel, you know that This Year in Perfume um, was really started to as a way to talk about a lot of different fragrances from a particular year or a certain time frame. And I ran through my collection initially, uh, but when I went through it the very first time, it was unranked. All right, so I just kind of showed bottles from my collection from either a certain year or groupings of, of years or decade or something like that. And now we're going back around a second time, but this time we're ranking them from my favorite to my least favorite. And uh, it's a very tough task, especially once you get into the years of 1979 and 1980, because these are literally some of my favorite years in perfume. We're starting to get into the years where, if you've been following the series, uh, you know that when I started ranking them, I went by decades. It actually first, excuse me, uh, I went by multiple decades because we did everything before the Roaring Twenties, just thrown together, right? Uh, and then we did the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Then we did the first half of the 70s. And the most recent one that we did was uh, 76, 77, 78. So then we only did three years. This video is going to be only two years. And the next video for 1981 is going to be only one year. And that's probably how it'll go for a little bit. Uh, but it worked out perfectly because this turned out to be a top 20. And so it was just like it was meant to be, right? 20 fragrances from my collection from the year 1979 to 1980 ranked in order of my favorite on this day. Uh, it is currently March 14th of 2023. Obviously, tastes change. Um, if you go back and look at my top 100, you might see there are some switches, some, some differences here between how I ranked them in the top 100. You may also see some fragrances that have been added to the collection since I did the top 100 countdown. Um, and so this, this is a fun video, but I also took this very, very seriously. I've been playing with these rankings for a while. In fact, even right up until showtime, I basically switched something and I switched it back. I said, no, I can't do that. Um, but I'm still, you know, constantly thinking, do I have this right? It's, it's very hard to rank these. So the first thing that I have to say about this is, this is a list of absolute all-star fragrances. Number 20 is not worse than number one. Number 19 is not worse than number two. These are just my favorites to wear. If I had to rank them by my favorites to wear right this second. And so don't think, oh, it's only number 15 on the list. It's not good. Everything we're going to talk about today is a good fragrance. Every single thing. Uh, from the ones I have full bottles of to the decants that I'm thinking about getting full bottles of. This was a fantastic time in perfume history. But let's talk about world history. Let's talk about what was going on in the backdrop of these fragrances coming out. 1979, here's some major events from uh, thepeopleshistory.com. Three Mile Island occurred in 1979. Uh, huge, major, almost, you know, complete meltdown. Uh, and the China instituted its one-child policy rule per family, which has been very controversial. Um, Pink Floyd released The Wall. The uh, USSR invaded Afghanistan. Margaret Thatcher is elected prime minister in the UK. That was 1979. I can't believe that. Sony released its very first Walkman. Uh, and there were 63 hostages taken in the American embassy in Tehran. And, and we know kind of, um, we know the story there and how that ended. In 1980, the US defeats Soviet Union in ice hockey and what was dubbed the miracle on ice. I can't believe that was 1980. When I think about that, I mean, the um, kind of the flash uh, bulbs in my head, when I think about that particular moment, I see the pictures and just how excited everyone was at the time. It was a huge deal in 1980. Mount St. Helens erupt, erupted on May 18th. Uh, and, you know, you hear stories about people finding ash across their on their cars, like, halfway across the world. That was a crazy uh, volcanic eruption. We haven't had one of those lately. The uh, Iran-Iraq War began in, in September of 1980. 
CNN began its first broadcast on June 1st, back when they actually used to post news. Um, 3M begins selling uh, its latest product called Post-It Notes. That was 1980. Think about that. No Post-It Notes before 1980. Uh, John Lennon is shot to death. Former Beatle John Lennon is shot to death. And that seems like so long ago. It was only 1980. And um, there was a big fire in the MGM Hotel in Las Vegas. And uh, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, was sentenced to death for murdering 33 boys and young men that they know of. Um, and I, in, in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan was also, I believe, uh, officially sworn in as president. And I think that's when the hostage situation with, uh, with Iran officially uh, basically came to a close once uh, he became president. So very, very interesting list of events. Some of these things in my head feel like I could have said that happened yesterday. Some of them feel like they happened forever ago, but uh, that's just kind of a backdrop. I like going through those just so you kind of get an idea of what was going on in the world. So let's do Scent of the Day, and then we'll do what I'm hoping is going to be a reference video. Uh, and remember, taste can change. It's okay to change your taste or it's okay to change how you feel about a fragrance as time goes on. This is an art, it's not a science. If you say, this is my number one fragrance, or this is my favorite from this year, or whatever it is, next year or tomorrow, you could wake up and feel completely different. And that's okay. Like I said, this is a art form for me, it's not a science. Uh, if anyone tells you that for certain this fragrance is better than that one, they're just, you know, they're, they're just wrong actually. It is how you feel about a fragrance. It is, um, you know, you're the only one that smells out of your nose. You're the only one that knows what it smells like to smell through your nose. I don't know what it smells like to, to smell through your nose, and you don't know what it smells like to smell through my nose. And that's why it's so important to trust your nose. Um, and and that's why, you know, like I said earlier, this video is uh, is just my opinion right now. So let's do scent of the day, and then we'll hop into this. So scent of the day, I wore this to work, and I've been testing my Dior's, my Dior Privés lately because I was hoping to do a top five countdown with Eugene and, and Rich and Rudy very soon. Uh, we were planning it for tomorrow for Wednesday at noon. It ended up having to get canceled, um, but we are still going to hopefully try to do it at some point. But I wore this today, and this is only the third time I've worn this. I don't have a full bottle. Rich Mitch very kindly sent me a couple of these to get to know, and this is called Eau Noir. So, Eau Noir came out in 2004. It's a Francis Kirkjohn creation. I think it's one of his best creations of all time. Along with Absolute Pour Le Soir. And um, the other one that I think is really worthy of competing for his best fragrances of all time is a fragrance called Ciel de Gum. And Ciel de Gum is a fragrance that was created for a uh, department store in Russia. And it's discontinued now, along with Absolute Pour Le Soir. This is the only one that's left, and they he just actually re-released this um, in, in, as his first release of being in-house perfumer of Dior. Francis Kirkjohn re-released this, but they took the green coloring out, so the new juice is clear. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't know if it's been reformulated or not, but I can tell you that I really like this, and when I got it, or I did a video on this, actually, there's a video on the channel, you can go check it out. In the video, I basically said that I really enjoyed the scent, but it's not for me. It's kind of a pass because I already have M. Wash Sunshine Man, and I think that Sunshine Man is a better fragrance, and I stick by that. However, however, today, the spices and this mixture of this lovely, um, you know, this lovely mixture of lavender mixed with thyme, and the lavender thyme combination today really seemed to blend with the coffee and the licorice to just give it this vibe that just really popped on my skin. I loved wearing this today. It was a huge pleasure to get to wear this. Thank you to Rich Mitch for sending this to me, by the way. And that combination of lavender and thyme, interestingly enough, reminded me of a fragrance I never thought it would remind me of. It reminded me a little bit of um, a fragrance from the house of MDCI called Invasion Barbar. Now, that uses more vanilla and violet leaf and some other things. There's some vanilla here too, though. And what they call green stems. There is this uh, very strange, you know, almost like almost almost like it's hinting at a gourmand, 
you know, it's walking to the kitchen, but it's not a true gourmand yet. It's that kind of feeling, right? But I really loved it. I would love to have a vintage bottle of this, but it's very hard to find. Prices are through the roof. But if I ever find like a partial or something of a vintage, I would go for it. I'm really enjoying this today. So, Eau Noir was my scent of the day. All right, let's get started. Top 20 fragrances from 1979 and 1980. So, number 20. Very hard to put this here because this is a great fragrance. But again, when you have a top 20, something has to be last. And this ended up being last for me. This is a fragrance called Ivory de Balmain. Now, Ivory de Balmain is a fragrance that was released for women originally. But I think that this is... Um, completely wearable by anybody. It's a floral chipra, and it's a very complex floral chipra. It came out in uh, 1980, and uh, Michelle High is the perfumer. I'm not familiar uh, with the work of that perfumer. However, this opens up with this, um, and if you don't know anything about the House of Balmain, by the way, if you want to laugh, I mean, unless you're part of like the real elite, if you want to laugh, just go to Balmain's website and go take a look. We're talking $1,200 t-shirts, $5,000 pairs of sneakers. It's just absolutely insane. And the $5,000 sneakers are freaking hideous too, by the way. Um, so it's that kind of house. But uh, this will probably be the only Balmain product I ever own in my life. However, um, I really like this because it is such a different take on a Sheepra. So it has uh, a note that is known as Marigold. Apparently it's to to jet to GTs, I I, can't, I can never pronounce it. I'm uh, Americans are useless at pronunciation, anyways. Um, but yeah, marigold you could say, and it almost gives this um, hay-like texture to it. But there's there's some other notes in there like aldehydes and chamomile and violet and artemisia, and that's just at the top. It basically dries down to a floral chipra with beautiful orris and oak moss and all this stuff. There's even a raspberry note in the base. It's a very interesting fragrance. It's peppery while being floral. Um, it has that crazy opening with aldehydes and green artemisia, which sounds like a masculine fragrance, but then it turns very um, floral with Narcissus and Lily of the Valley and Carnation and Jasmine and Ylang and all this stuff. But there's masculine notes in here too. There's um, frankincense, there's nutmeg, there is pepper, uh, there's vetiver in here, but then there's the vanilla and all this, you know, it's a very complex fragrance. I just haven't been able to wrap my head around it. It hasn't spoken to me yet is the thing. I've got a chance to wear it a couple times, um, but it hasn't really spoken to me as far as I'm loving this yet. So I'm still going to continue to try it, but this is very, these are very hard to come by. I got this thanks to a news. This is an old tester, hence no cap. But uh, yes, Ivory de Balmain comes in at number 20. Number 19. Number 19 is a Paul Sebastian fragrance. And this house really doesn't get very much, um, it really doesn't get very much hype or anything like that. Even people like me who love vintage fragrances, many people don't talk about this fragrance. It's a, it's a cheapie. Uh, and I think it's even still available for purchase. I have no clue what the current version of this is like. This is a vintage bottle. I'll show you what the bottom looks like. Um, this is a vintage bottle of... Paul Sebastian's Fine Cologne is what this is known by. Fine Cologne. And Paul Sebastian's Fine Cologne um, is a very tough fragrance to pin down. I've heard people say that because it's got lavender, uh, that it kind of leans like a barber shop. But to me, you know what I get is I get a little bit of an unbalanced fragrance because... Yes, there's lavender. Yes, there's some herbal notes, sage or, or mugwort, artemisia, you know, something like that. But there's this, um, almost like this, uh, this floral that just really kind of takes over. And the, the floral that takes over the scent to me smells a little bit like uh, ylang ylang. It smells a little bit like ylang and jasmine mixed together. And... With that Ylang and Jasmine, you get this huge musk note, almost like the 1970s style Coty musk musk is what you kind of get in here. Um, you know, Jovan musk or Coty's musk. If you smell some of those musk fragrances from the uh, 70s, you'll kind of get an idea of the type of musk that I'm that I'm referring to here. It is mixed with sandalwood and myrrh and patchouli and vanilla, and I'm sure I could probably grow to love this a little bit more. 
But this is another one where it just, I, I enjoy it, but I don't love it. I don't know if I'll ever love this one, just because it just seems a little unbalanced for some reason. Doesn't seem like a true barbershop, fougere, or anything like that. Um, it does have this, a little bit of this animalic touch to it from the musk. If you know kind of that 70s style musk, you'll kind of have an idea of the way that the musk is used here. Um, but I, I completely see why it doesn't get the hype that, you know, other fragrances from this time period do. Excuse me. Whilst I hydrate. <laughs> okay, so that was number 19, Paul Sebastian's Fine Cologne. If you get a chance, though, do smell it. Um, you know, I don't think it's a rubbish fragrance or anything like that. I don't think it's trash. I think it's a good fragrance. I just think, um, it's hard to be excited to wear this when there's just so much from these, from the 70s and 80s that are just so amazing. You know, it's kind of in no man's land for me. It just never, um, it never just really grabbed me, you know? Okay, that was number, um, eight, number 19. Number 18. Number 18 is going to be a decant. I only have a decant of the next two fragrances, uh, but this is one that is probably full bottle worthy. It is discontinued. If I ever find a really good deal, I'm gonna grab a bottle of this. And this is called Jean-Louis Scherer. Now, I actually did grab Scherer Part Two, which came out in the mid 80s, and it's right here. This is what the bottle of um, Scherer Part Two looks like. Jean-Louis Scherer. Looks like this, kind of a cool little bottle. I like it. It's, um, and I got a great deal on this. Um, and this is discontinued. Russian Adam actually turned me on to this one. <sighs> yes, so the second one's good, but the first one is also good. The first one doesn't get as much love because it doesn't have the animalics of the second one. The second one has, um, the second one has more of an animalic touch to it. There's this, Rose and myrrh and Mysore sandalwood. There's Mysore sandalwood in here. If you guys knew how much I paid for this, you would absolutely choke. I mean, it is, it's stunning how, um, you know, if you're a hunter of vintage fragrances, you'll find that sometimes these deals of unhyped fragrances just completely fall on your lap and you just can't say no. And there's Mysore sandalwood in this. It's a beautiful concoction, but there's also castorium and all this other stuff in part two. Part one doesn't have the civet and castorium and that animalic bit to it. So it never got the love, I think, in the fragrance community online that part two did. So part one is, is a green floral sheepra, basically. And, but there's beautiful notes in here. There's Florentine iris, which is a very expensive iris. Uh, if you listen to Italians, they'll tell you it's the most expensive iris in the world. Uh, so it's Florentine iris, there's Bulgarian rose, there's Jasmine absolute, um, and, but there's also, again, Mysore sandalwood in here, there's oak moss, there's vetiver, and there's patchouli. So even though it's a green, it opens up with galvanum, which was a very popular, uh, note for a woman's fragrance in the 70s. That green thing was huge in the 1970s. And Jean-Louis Scherer, um, they did a great job with this one. It just gets overshadowed, I think. But I bet if I find a good deal, I will grab a bottle of this. It is very well made. And they're just, no matter no matter how high into the niche game you go, you're never going to find something that has ingredients like this anymore. Even, you know, the best sandalwood they use right now will not be Mysore. It'll be different. It can be a different type of sandalwood. There's nothing wrong with the other types of sandalwood that are out there. It's just the value for money. If you find a bottle of this for 20 or 30 bucks, you, you'll never in modern in the modern perfume days find something with this kind of value for money floating around. So Jean-Louis Scherer comes in at number 18. Number 17 is a decant that Anuj made for me. And again, another one that is absolutely full bottle worthy. It's discontinued though. So I don't know... Um, Pricing. I haven't looked at pricing on, on any of these, but I would definitely get a bottle of this. But I think its older sister, Calendre, the first Paco Rabanne fragrance that ever comes out, is higher up on my wish list. But this is still very good. This is called Metal. Paco Rabanne's Metal. Thank you, Anouj, for bu bu building this little decant for me, by the way. And this is basically a, a floral, woody type fragrance, but it opens up very aldehydic and, and very bright. 
And there's something about the florals in here. I don't know what it is, whether it's the lily of the valley, the jasmine, the rose. I don't know if there's Elaine. I don't know what the floral notes are, but whatever the floral notes are in here, they are absolutely captivatingly beautiful with this little green touch. And I'm not sure, there's no green notes listed. In Parfumo, they only list aldehyde, citrus fruits, floral notes, uh, oak moss, musk, and woody notes. And that's it. That's all they list. And um, this is 1979. So I don't think, you know, they were using some sort of, you know, amber woody base that didn't exist back then it's just the note listing is a little bit vague um so you kind of have to guess and my guess is that there's a huge floral bouquet in the heart of this but it's absolutely stunningly executed just a beautiful floral fragrance not my favorite to wear not my favorite thing um but i can definitely just appreciate it for what it is and, and it definitely deserves pops it's props so paco Rabanne metal comes in at number uh, 17. All right, number 16, back to the full bottles. And I actually pulled out both to show you guys because this is a newer fragrance to my uh, collection, but I can already tell just the quality and again, value for money. And this is why I love vintage fragrances. And again, trusting my nose. No one told me to love these fragrances. I just fell in love with them from smelling, just from getting to know them, from smelling them. And, you know, I didn't watch YouTube videos that hype this or anything like that. I just smelled some vintage fragrances and you fall in love with some stuff. And this is one of them. And this is actually, I think this might be the earliest fragrance in my collection from Maurice Roussel. This is all the way from 1980. And Maurice Roussel made K de Crizia. Now I pulled out both the Eau de Toilette and the Eau de Parfum, and you can see there is a little bit of a color difference between the two. You can kind of see the Eau de Toilette is uh, much darker than the Eau de Parfum as far as the juice goes. This is much more ambery. Um, you know, this has more of an orange type tint to it. Um, but this is also a Chypre. I would probably consider K, K de Crizia more of a uh, animalic Chypre though. So whereas uh, John louis Scherer was much uh, green and cleaner and that kind of thing, this uses a lot more animalics. And if you really pay attention, I really feel like you can even see uh, Maurice Roussel's patented musk being used in here. There's this musky side of K de Crizia that comes out in the dry down. And the ingredients smell of the highest quality, I'm telling you. And if you could, I mean, the, everything about this is premium. The bottle, the cap, um, you know, this is a very heavy feeling bottle. And um, it, it's discontinued. Caritia doesn't make this anymore. But they are such an underrated house. I have professed my love for uh, Teatro Alla Scala more times than I can imagine on, on my YouTube channel so far in the first year of knowing Tietro Alla Scala. And this is another one, I don't love it as much as Tietro Alla Scala, and that's why it's at number 16. But you could go for the Eau de Toilette, you could go for the Eau de Parfum, they're both stunning. I mean, they, they literally just, it feels like in the old days, it's not like nowadays where the Eau de Parfum can sometimes be like completely different fragrance. No, I mean, back then, you could tell the Eau de Parfum was just kind of an amped up version of the Eau de Toilette. And this thing lasts forever on my skin. I've only tested it at going to bed, but I can smell this the next day when I wake up easy if I spray it on before bed. Um, the longevity is outrageous with some of these old Eau de Toilettes. And, um, but it opens up very aldehydic and fruity with a ton of florals. Again, monster floral heart, very similar to what... Um, you know, I was guessing with some of the previous two fragrances, both had huge floral hearts. This one does as well. The reason this beats them out is just because of the uh, execution in the dry down. It starts to turn very leathery on my skin, and you get these very high quality animalics that start to kick in. So you'll get the civet, you'll get the ambergris, um, and that leather note, of course, sells it for me. I love leather in a Chypre, and you do get the flowers. There's no doubt about it. This is a floral Chypre to me because, I mean, look at the heart. Lily of the Valley, Carnation, 
which here can smell spicy and also green. The rose is very lush. Uh, there is tuberose even, and, and sometimes tuberose is a no-no for some people. I would urge you to still kind of uh, give this a shot. Uh, give this a shot, even if even if tuberose is usually a no-no for you, you will just you'll see how beautiful the ingredients are blended. And the kicker here is the iris. The iris in K. decretia is is you can detect it. It smells expensive. It smells slightly powdery, um, but you know you're gonna get the you're gonna get the animalics that kind of offset that big floral heart. And usually when animalics are used in that way, it almost makes the florals. Uh, go down easier. You know, it makes them more palatable to me. So, K. de Crizia deserves some love for sure in the um, in in the uh, in the in the vintage countdown. So, K. de Crizia, either version. I didn't rank them separately. They're both just lumped together at number sixteen. Number fifteen is a little bit of a surprise for me because if you know my tastes, you would think that K. de Crizia would actually be higher ranked than this. Uh, because it's an animalic leather Chipra. Um, but there is something about this fragrance that I am obsessed with. I don't know what it is. I haven't figured it out yet. I think it's just the way it's executed is all. Um, and by the way, back to K, K de Crizia, there's no difference between the Eau de Toilette or Eau de Parfum. They both have the, um, they both have the same exact note listing. So this next one coming in at number 15 I just think it's the way that um, that it, that it was executed, and I'm really imp impressed with this house. So this is a house called Pascal Moribito, and you'll see them again when I do my 1981 video uh, because they put out a masculine fragrance in 1981 that is primo. Uh, and but this one from 1980 is for women, and it's called O R Noir. So O R Noir, and I've got this little. Uh, mini that Anuj sent me as well. Uh, so this is the, the big boy bottle from Pascal Moribito. And I think this is discontinued as well. Actually, no, I think I think it's still available. Uh, I don't know who's marketing it now, and I don't know what the new version is like. But you can, you can kind of tell this is an older version by the um, 85 proof down there on the bottom. And this one, I think, might be even older because it is a 90 proof. So you can see right there, it's a 90 proof. Um, and so these are older bottles. I don't know what the new one's like. This is also a Shepra. It's also an aldehydic floral Shepra. Um, the aldehydes on this are the biggest out of all of them so far. The, the, two, the aldehydes um, in Jean-Louis Cher... Metal and O.R. Noir are, are huge. There, I think there are some aldehydes in K. de Crizia. It was just kind of the style at the time for women's fragrances. But the aldehydes in this are out of this world. In fact, think about Chanel Number no. 5 type aldehydes. It's like that in the opening. But there is something I can't put my finger on. Um, there's some sort of blend between the aldehydes. I think it's, the, I think it's this connection from like aldehyde iris sandalwood there's no sandalwood listed but i get the sandalwood in the base with patchouli and oak moss and oh my god it's just an amber and there's this amber in the base there's also a huge floral heart okay so it's extremely floral it's also a little bit spicy it has that cheaper construction um and it is uh so the florals are gardenia iris jasmine lily of the valley rose and ylang ylang and it's an aldehydic floral. And that aldehydic hit in the first hour, maybe even two hours, it's an aldehydic floral through and through. And you would think, God, uh, Ramsey would not like this. There is something. I don't know if it's just the ingredients. I have no clue what it is, but I am infatuated with this stuff. Um, I, I, I have not worn it as my scent of the day yet. I usually save these for like before bed type fragrances because I like to wear my masculines out and about especially when I got to go to work and stuff like that. I could easily wear this because I think anyone can wear anything. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this. And I'd probably be the best smelling guy in the room if I wore this, but I usually wear these to bed. Um, and there is just something, and I've reached for this kind of as my, as my nighttime scent multiple times now already. 
it is uh, it is really something. Don't overlook this like I did. And shout out to uh, I think it was Jonathan who who said I really need to grab a bottle of this, and and he was right, hundred percent right. So I can't wait to can't wait to get to our nineteen eighty one where we talk about the masculine. They they it's a good house. It's a house I need to explore more. Pascal Moribito, number fifteen for O R Noir. Number fourteen is a Cheruti fragrance. And this is Nino Ceruti Porom. Now, this is literally, I actually think that this is the greatest um, floral masculine fragrance of this genre. So this gets compared a lot to Givenchy Ensense from, I think, the early 90s or late 80s, early 90s. Uh, but this is 10 times better. And that's considered to be like this vintage, you know, unicorn thing. No. I would pass on uh, the Givenchy, and I would just go straight to this. This is, um, this is, there is just something, you know, it's interesting because if you know some of the people from the past that I really respect um, that have YouTube channels that have been doing it for way, way longer than I have, uh, I've talked about a couple people, but one who's really influenced my taste is Chris from Scentland, and he was once asked if you could keep one vintage fragrance for life, what would it be? He said this. He said if he could get this, this would be his signature scent, and he would just wear this and nothing else. And I thought, whoa, this is before I've, uh, I found this bottle. I was like, I have to hunt this down. It is, uh, it's, just, it's just a must now. So it's basically this spicy, woody, floral fragrance. But the florals are there. You'll, you'll get them almost from the word go. You're going to get the florals. Uh, but there's a lot of other things kind of playing a role here. So... There is a little bit of mint, but it's not like toothpaste or anything like that. There's green galvanum. Again, this is the 70s. Galvanum was uh, a popular note. And there's juniper, which adds this sprightly freshness. You know, juniper um, sprigs are used to um, are used to kind of decorate gin, right? They'll 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 put juniper in in a in a in a glass of gin, and it has that kind of gin fizzy. It, it always makes me think of like, you know, the, um, like a, just a glass of gin, you know, it just, it, it has that aesthetic about it. This sort of, um, it adds this sort of, uh, you know, almost like you're smelling an aldehyde, but it's a little bit different when you, when you smell juniper to me, um, very fresh type note. And I really like juniper a little bit green as well. Uh, and, and to add to the greenness, is a, a note of stone pine. So there's stone pine and thyme. The florals are carnation, which is a traditionally masculine floral. Uh, that They used to use carnation in old school masculines a lot back in the day. Not so much anymore, but back in the day. And jasmine. And you would think, wow, jasmine in a, in a masculine. And it's beautiful though. It's very well done here. With a base of amber, cedar wood, fir, musk, benzoin, and moss. This will be getting a lot of wear this spring and summer. Um, this is the kind of scent for me that's a spring and summer scent. Because even though it's woody, it has this, you know, freshness about it. And the mint and the juniper and the bergamot and all that stuff is just absolutely beautiful. And the kicker, though, is there is a twist with this. The twist is there's, these, there's this fruity-like feel. So after everything I've said for being like a spring and a summer fragrance, uh, the fruity... The fruitiness gives it this strange freshness that you just don't expect. You know, the juniper and the mint and the citruses and, and all that stuff already give it this fresh-like feel. But the um, the fruity notes almost add this, you know, almost like a slight bit of playfulness about it. Almost like a man who was wearing a tie and he took the tie off and like now, now he's loosened his tie up. He's, he's worked all day. But the tie is loose, you know, and he's and he's at the bar having his first drink, you know, and he's ready to just kind of relax. And you can tell he's a serious professional guy. But if you were going to, you know, crack a joke with him, now would be the time because he's kind of in a relaxed mood, not in the middle of the workday. That's the feeling that this fruitiness gives to the fragrance. There's not a playfulness um, because it's a very buttoned up. This is a very professional buttoned up smell to me. Extremely masculine. Um, 
But I think, you know, because of the, it's hard to say something with florals like this is extremely masculine is the crazy part because, you know, Ensense to me is almost like a feminine fragrance that they just targeted to men. There's something about this one though, even though I think it reminds me a little bit of Ensense, it's just done a million times better. Just the execution of it. Um, I'm just, I'm just over the moon to have this bottle. So yes, Nino Ceruti. Poron from 1979, a true unicorn, very hard to find, but um, comes in at number 14. And that just shows how hard it is to rank these fragrances. I'm calling this one of the best masculine floral heavy fragrances ever, and it's number 14 on this list. Number 13, and, and to be fair, a lot of this is taste, because you guys know my taste, the leathers, the animalics. Um, you know, and, and we're going to start coming up on some of those. So it's hard to rank something like Nino Ceruti Porome ahead of ahead of those. But OK, so next on the list, we have number uh, 13. And again, very hard to put this at number 13, but I think this is where it has to go. Uh, this is Rochas Macassar. Macassar, if you will. Macassar or Macassar. Uh, we'll, we'll say fielder's choice. You, you call it, you call how you want to describe it. Um, and so Macassar is a very interesting creation. It came out in 1980. It's completely discontinued. There are multiple versions of this actually. Thanks again to Rich Mitch. Uh, he sent me in, in a decant that's very similar to this. He sent me a few very precious drops of the original Macassar, um, and I did a comparison video, and the good news is, is you can go check that video out if you're really interested in getting into the nitty gritty details of the comparison. The good news is this is a good reformulation, a very good reformulation. And I think I paid, oh, I don't know, 80 bucks for this maybe. And so if you see this bottle at a cheap price and you're interested in, in uh, Macassar, go for it. Grab it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this bottle. It's very good. The notes say uh, laurel, artemisia, uh, tobacco flowers, tobacco flowers, not tobacco, although there is a little bit of a tobacco feel, uh, geranium with sandalwood, uh, gua guyac wood, and macassar woods. So basically, to me, um, this fragrance is going to be a competition with something like Yatagan. If you know Yatagan, there's actually another fragrance coming up here very soon. I would say they kind of play in the same sandbox, if you will. There's something about that earthy green. It's very earthy and green and, um, you know, leather castorium. And you would think, wow, leather castorium, earthy green. This would be like number one for Ramsey. There's just something about uh, the blend. Uh, of of this it just keeps it out of 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 the highest rated leather leathers for me i think it's a very good leather um it's 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 so unique i i very rarely have i smelled a fragrance that uh is blended like this with these notes um there's patchouli there's carnation there's cedar there's definitely woods you get the woods i mean it's 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 like being I mean, it's like being in a forest with a very expensive, like, leather satchel is what it kind of feels like to me. But a lot of pine and a lot of tarragon. And, you know, uh, if you know kind of the pine green feel from Polo Green from 1978, which actually came out a couple years before this, um, you'll you'll kind of be in the ballpark with the pine. Yeah, go go check out my comparison video for for a deeper comparison of uh, Rochas uh, Macassar. We'll go back and forth between between the two, um, but very hard to find these bottles. And if you find an original bottle, they usually want big money for it. Uh, but it, but again, a true unicorn from from 1980. Macassar comes in at number 13. Number 12, and this one I went back and forth with. Uh, the Rochus was ahead, and then and then finally, um, this one was ahead, and it ended up staying ahead because of uh, the story behind it and the reform in the reformulation. So when I first got this fragrance, this is uh, Jacques Bogart one man show. I hated it. 
despised it. Actually, I, I, I thought it was a bad fragrance. I thought this actually was a rubbish fragrance. And in this bottle, the new stuff that they're selling is, I don't think this is a good fragrance at all. Uh, I think this is a bad reformulation, which I almost never say with the house of Jacques Bogart ever. Usually they do fantastic reformulations. So I was very hesitant to go buy an older one because I thought this just must be what it's like. Um, I didn't think there that uh, I, I've never come across a Jacques Bogart fragrance that was reformulated bad, badly until One Man Show. This is the first one. And so what I did is I found a really cheap deal on these little, uh, they're not, they're not true minis. I think these are maybe, how much are you? You are 30 mils. So these are 30 mils and I got like five of them. So I got a lot of juice on the vintage, but if you look down below, you'll see 85 proof and you'll see, you can kind of see the difference. Um, this one says 87 proof. This one says 85. This is the older version. And, um, I mean, yeah, it's hard to see the juice color through there, but al almost a completely different fragrance. Almost. And the reason it's a completely different fragrance on One Man Show is that uh, they almost totally took out the castorium and this leather note in the new one. Almost like completely removed it. It almost just makes it a sort of... Uh, spicy woody green type smell and that's it and kind of a flat one at that so i was very disappointed in this i was like i don't understand the hype people are talking about what a beast it is and how amazing it is and i just didn't get it right till i got this and as soon as i got this as soon as i sprayed it for the very first time decanted it and then sprayed it i was like i completely understand now it is it is immense it is a huge fragrance and it truly does live up to, it truly lives up to the hype that people used to give this. It's almost, it's almost two completely different fragrances. If you put these next to each other in a blind sniff for me, I would think they're, I, I wouldn't even think they were related at all. Uh, and I actually think I prefer the vintage one man show to uh, Rochus Macassar. And so it just barely edged it out. This has the addition of Basil. And Brazilian rosewood, which I absolutely love rosewood. Um, my mom had a rosewood rosary that she used to make me pray every Easter. And that smell is like, uh, and it was like, it, I think it was like from the Holy Land rosewood kind of thing. Uh, and she would keep it in this box. And so it would stay there all year. And when we would take it out for Easter, that rosewood smell was, was very prominent. Um, I love rosewood. So there's rosewood. There's a uh, galbanum. There's Lang Ylang, Grapefruit, Jasmine, Rose, Frankincense, which the Frankincense also seems more amped up in this version. Frankincense, um, Lebanon Cedar, Nutmeg, Patchouli, Sandalwood, Cystus, Labdanum, okay, and Castorium. All right, so this one, you get much more of a uh, animalic, leathery dry down, which I absolutely love. And uh, if... If you, if you kind of went the route that I did, if you ever smelled one man show and thought, man, I don't understand this. doesn't make sense why people are hyping this so much. If you can find a cheap vintage bottle, go for it. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's night and day. One of these days I'll do a comparison video. Um, I just don't want to spray the old stuff on or the new stuff on my skin, to be honest. I do not like that new one. Roger Pellegrino was the perfumer, by the way, in 1980. One man show comes in at number... Uh, 12. Number 11 is one that you're probably never going to think. Is this good? It is. Uh, and it just goes to show, again, going back to vintage fragrance and why I fell in love with it. This was the cheap product that Ralph Lauren sold. So Polo, uh, Polo Green as it's now known, but originally it was just Ralph Lauren Polo. Uh, that was the expensive one. That was, there's a beautiful comment on that uh, video that I did, 1976, 77, 78. I think JT left it. And where he talks about um, Polo smelling like the inside of a boardroom in, you know, America in the late in the late 70s and 80s. Chesterfield cabinets and, um, you know, cigar smoke and, and, you know, just the smell of being at the top, the smell of success. That, 
Those were the type of people, the CEOs uh, of America. They were the type of people that wore polo green, polo by Ralph Lauren from 1978. This was what was kind of marketed towards the masses. And this is called Chaps by Ralph Lauren. Now, Chaps, um, and I have two big bottles of this. I have three bottles of this stuff. I love it so much. This, I don't know if you can kind of see, but this actually is a, which way is it? It's this way. So this is a Warner bottle. You know, everyone talks about, oh, Warner, Cosmere. Uh, you can see it says Warner Cosmetics. And then below that, it says Distributed Cosmere Inc. Very interesting. So the other two bottles that I have are Cosmere bottles of uh, Chaps. This stuff is absolutely phenomenal. The only thing that uh, I think might hold this back for some men is it's very powdery. There is a floral aspect and there's something about it. Uh, I'm not sure what it's coming from because I don't think there's any orris or any like, you know, iris or powdery notes from that fat, from that side of things, but it almost feels like there is. It feels like they've literally taken a leathery, earthy sheepra and added some sort of, um, you know, you know when they ride the bulls? You know when the guys ride the bulls in, in, in the rodeos and they like put that powder on their gloves and like hit their hands and, and it kind of goes up before they grab onto the rope? Um, that's kind of what the powder feels like. But very, this this fragrance was created by uh, Josephine Catapano, if I'm not mistaken. And she created some absolute amazing fragrances. She created You Do by Estee Lauder, which ended up influencing one of my favorite fragrances of all time. Opium by YSL was was um, inspired by You Do by, by Estee Lauder. And she made this amongst, amongst many other things. She also helped make JHL for Joseph Henry Lauder because he loved um, that style, that oriental style of, uh, of, of opium and didn't want to wear a woman's fragrance, so she helped uh, create that for for him, basically. And I think he only got to wear it a year or two, and then he passed away, unfortunately. But uh, so she made this in 1979, and this was the cheap fragrance. This was the one that I think sold for like five bucks for the biggest bottle they had, right? In in when it when it came out, and listen to the note listing: sage, bergamot, lemon, and lime with spices, and maybe it's the spices that are giving it a little bit of a powdery touch because you do get this powdery spice-like feel with jasmine and lavender, oak moss, ambergris, leather, uh, patchouli, sandalwood, vanilla, and vetiver. And also the vanilla, that could add a little bit of a powdery, uh, powdery feel to it, but it's leathery, it's woody. Oh, the, the herbs, the spices mixed with that powdery, Leather, it's just, I mean, I love, as soon as I smelled it, I knew I loved this stuff. And I had to get, I had to have multiple bottles of this. Uh, discontinued now, officially, unfortunately, in any version. I know some people were saying that the new ones weren't as good as the Cosmere or Warner bottles, but now it's completely discontinued. But um, but yes, chaps, this is, this is much better than Stetson, which I think Stetson came out to really compete with chaps, but... I would take Chaps all day. Stetson's still good, but Chaps is amazing at number 11. Number 10. So I know earlier I said there was a fragrance that uh, competed with Yatagan to kind of play in the same sandbox as uh, Rochas Makassar. And that fragrance is our number 10 fragrance. It's from the house of Capucci. And this is called Punjab. Now, some people say Punjab is offensive uh, as a name. So I'm not going to talk about that topic, but I will tell you about the fragrance. It's a woody, spicy fragrance. Some people say uh, that fragrances from the 70s have this brown smell to them. Look at the color of the juice. See how it has that brown tinge to it? You ever walked into like, you know what this smell reminds me of? Um, you ever, as a kid, go to a roll, like a, like a skating rink? And, you know, you can, skating rinks have this distinctive smell to them for some reason. Um, you can smell the wood on the ground, right? They polish it. They, they keep it clean. Um, 
this woody, spicy, you know, like a, like a time, like a, like a woody, spicy fragrance from, from an, from an ancient time, if you will. But there's also this, uh, pine, which was very popular in, in the late seventies and early eighties among masculine fragrances. I already talked about, uh, polo. We talked about, uh, pine in one man show and Macassar and now Punjab as well. It has pine, it has Artemisia, uh, but it, de it definitely has this 70s brown feet smell to it somehow. This almost like the notes just come together to give it this 70s, you know, plaid couch smell, uh, roller rink smell. It's very, very strange. But the leather and the pine does give it this Yatagan-like vibe. And if you've ever smelled Yatagan, you know it has this kind of forced floor, you know, undisturbed uh, leaves that have been you know, um, there's some fungus growing underneath that's never been unearthed and you come along and you kind of kick up these old leaves and you, uh, you unearth literally kind of this patch of land that's been kind of soaking under soggy leaves and rainfall. And, uh, and then you come along and kind of disturb that and you get hit with the smell of the forest, right? And a little bit of decay. And there's a little bit of that here. Um, there is some juniper in the top and marjoram, which adds a little bit of freshness with the bergamot and lemon. Uh, there's cedarwood and pine, patchouli, carnation, again, masculine floral, with cinnamon, geranium, and jasmine, believe it or not. You noticed a couple of these have jasmine, these masculine fragrances for men from the 70s and, and early 80s. There's fir, frankincense, moss, amber, leather, musk, and myrrh. So if you like this, if you like Makassar, or if you like uh, Caron's Yatagan, I would urge you to also check out Punjab. It is very, very good. Uh, I wish I had more juice. This is all I have. I cherish it a little bit. The atomizer on this is crazy. It's one of these where you like just spray. It must be a pressurized one. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it just sprays. It just, I feel like you could just hold this trigger down for, uh, if you held this trigger down, the whole bottle would just end up coming out. Uh, it'll just spray and spray and spray. It's it's unbelievable. Um, but yes, Punjab comes in at number uh, 10. Number 9. Number 9 is one that I actually have the Eau de Cologne version. I want the Eau de Toilette version of this. This is a house that I've really come to respect. I, although I only own a couple of their fragrances. It's called uh, Jean de, de Prez. And Jean de Prez has two fragrances that I own in my collection. One is Bala Versailles, which I absolutely love. I have a full review on that. You can go check it out. And the other is called Versailles Pour Homme. Now, this is the Eau de Cologne version. Uh, there is also an Eau de Toilette, which has a, I believe, white instead of a black cap. Uh, but this is one of these flies under the radar. Again, no one ever talks about, hardly anyone talks about this. Even the vintage guys don't talk about Versailles Pour Homme very much. Uh, there is something about the blend. Uh, some Something about the blend of woods and uh, leather with all of these other, uh, you know, notes that kind of prop it up that will remind you a little bit of Aramis. If you've ever smelled the original Aramis from 1964, 65-ish, uh, you'll, you'll get a little bit of that in Versailles Pour Homme. The difference is, is it uses notes that are in some of the most classic fragrances of the time period. If you know the pimento, which gets used from what many consider to be the greatest masculine of all time, which is going to be, uh, in the top three here. Uh, there's this pimento and clary sage and, and just this general, I would say, um, almost like an Italian style herbal, lemony, uh, bergamot freshness with some green notes. And that really set, uh, sets it apart from Aramis for me. There's also that stone, stone pine that I talked about earlier um, with multiple types of woods, sandalwood and cedarwood. And the cedarwood here almost smells like you're smelling like a it almost smells like you're smelling like a traditional red cedar wood, you know, like, um, uh, 
like you're in just small town USA church that was built, you know, uh, using cedar wood from, from its founders a hundred years ago. And, and you're in a hundred or 150 years ago, and you're standing in this old timey church and you get a little bit of that frankincense, but there's also amber and leather and vanilla and styrax and labdanum. Uh, for an eau de cologne, this stuff lasts forever, forever. Uh, but I still think I want the eau de toilette as a collector piece. Okay, that was number nine, uh, Versailles Pour Homme by, Je by Jean de Prez. And if you've never checked out Bala Versailles and you like animalics, I would highly urge you to do so. Okay. Number eight. Number eight is the very first fragrance from the actor Alain Delon. And this is actually the very original Alain Delon fragrance from 1980. Now, what I will tell you about this one is it's a spicy resinous um, fragrance that was re-released under this. It was called Alain Delon Classic. So the original didn't say classic. It was just Alain Delon. No classic right here. And then they re-released it under classy. You can see the juice color. I have a comparison video on my channel. If you want to go check out the differences, I actually really like this. Almost to the point where I think I like it more than the uh, original. However, the, it's a different fragrance almost. Um, I feel like this is much more green. It's a little bit more harsh. Uh, this uses more of the honey and that geranium note, I really feel like the geranium note is really amped up here, which geranium can sometimes come across as uh, almost having this rose-like smell. Some perfumers use geranium in place of rose. Um, and so the original, I just feel like there's more of this mugwort, green, basil, pine, you know, uh, almost tart, sharp, green. This is much more smoother. It's uh, It still has some of that spicy, resinous. Uh, the thing about this that I absolutely love is honey is one of my favorite notes. And if you've ever smelled, uh, there's a Marbert fragrance called Marbert Man. And I actually just got the vintage and I'm in the, current, I'm in the stage of testing it still. But uh, Marbert Man, I, I called it a kind of fresh, easy to wear, like a honey fragrance. There are animalics in there as well, but there's this freshness about it. And this has that. This has this, um, this has this juniper, bergamot, you know, lavender, aldehydic, kind of easy going, old school style about it that, oh, I absolutely love this stuff. I'm so happy to have it. I think if I was forced to give up one of these bottles, I would give up the vintage. That just goes to show. I mean, it's not, again, trust your nose. Don't go off of people going, oh, you know, I looked at reviews of this and there were people saying, oh, this one is is trash. You know, it can't hold a candle to the vintage, like, like people usually say. And normally they're right. And But in this case, I will tell you that I actually think I prefer the classic. Uh, this is a fantastic reformulation if you will it's so good so so good uh and it was very hard for me to put this at number uh eight but i did i had to i had to put it at number eight because we're getting to the big hitters here number seven number seven is uh probably one of my favorite um smoky dark you know there's this um there's this beautiful uh almost like earthy smokiness to this fragrance, and it's called Giacomo de Giacomo. Now, I will tell you right from the get-go, if you get this bottle, okay, without the blue writing on it, you will be disappointed, 100%. This smells so cheap and synthetic. When I got this, I was like, no way. No way this is what people are hyping up. This is this is trash. Uh, this is shite. I hated it. And uh, people kept telling me, you got the wrong, you got the new version, there's actually a third version as well, I think, of this. And then now it's officially discontinued. Uh, I think this version is the one in the middle, if I'm not mistaken. But either way, the one you want has blue writing on it. It won't look like this because this is actually a tester bottle. You can see Enchante's sticker on the back, the best little perfume shop in the world. And um, all that matters is you get the one with the blue writing, okay? Even if the bottle kind of looks like this, 
If it has the blue writing on it, you're good. And uh, it's, it's, again, almost a completely different fragrance. Almost as bad as the one-man show reformulation that we talked about earlier. So get the one with the blue writing. You'll be happy. It's smoky. It's spicy. It's basically a earthy, spicy, smoky fragrance. But it's dark. Imagine dark smoke. Um, imagine like cooked galbanum, like black, black, like charcoal galbanum. Uh, there was a uh, Serge Luton uh, fragrance that I got to uh, experience for the very first time within the last month or so called uh, La Participe Passe, if memory serves. You can go check out my Serge Luton or go through the old videos. You'll see it. But I, I, I said that had this cauldron like uh, like vibe. And this has a little bit of that cauldron smell as well. There's this earthy, smoky, dark feel, but there's clove. The clove is very prominent, by the way. Clary sage, sorry, caraway, cinnamon, geranium, rosewood, oak moss, and patchouli. And as soon as I got this and sprayed it, I was like, okay, I completely understand why people love this now. Uh, but the reformulation, shite to me. I don't like it. Uh, so go for the vintage there if you can. Okay, next on the list. Next on the list, we have uh, number six, and you guys might be surprised that this is this high. It was almost higher. It almost beat out the next fragrance, and you're going to be shocked at the next fragrance, too. Uh, but it almost beat out the next fragrance. This is number six. This is Wheel Pour Homme. And this bottle is courtesy of uh, Keith Manly Sense. Thank you, man. Really appreciate you uh, sharing this with me. I mean, I bought it from him, but he... Uh, it was sold out of his collection, basically. And so Wheel Pour Homme, he did the same thing with Rich. If you go watch Rich Mitch's video, he sold him a bottle as well. So extra shout out to uh, to Keith for that. Uh, because this is, I think, I have come to conclude that if you like uh, Guerlain's Derby, there is a lot of... Um, the, the way that the spices and the leather kind of blend together in Guerlain's Derby, you'll get a lot of that in here. There is a lot of similarities, especially with the spice. Um, one of the... Oh shit, I think I, I think I took this cap off wrong. Interesting, I didn't realize it opened up. I've never seen that. Here, let me share this with you, look at this. So... So I guess you can um, take the actual top off, right, like this. So you take the top off, and it makes it easier to splash without spilling so much. And then you spin it off, and you get the real opening. How's I've never seen that before. That's really cool, and I just did that by accident. Um, I was like, what the hell? So very interesting. Um, so wheel, pour on. If you want to look at the funniest advertisement campaign of all time, go to Parfumo, go to Wheel Pour Homme, and just look at this guy. This was the guy in the advertising campaign. It's just such a different world back then. Uh, he's like at an art museum. He looks like the biggest geek in the world. Huge glasses, balding a little bit. Um, you know, kind of dressed in professional clothes like I'm wearing right now. And he's looking at an art museum, art museum piece, and it looks like he's uh, holding court, explaining it. And the woman is like obviously charmed, you know, but she's like looking the other way. Uh, and it's just classic 1980s advertising. I absolutely love it, and I love the scent. And as for as much love as Guerlain's Derby gets, and it deserves it because it is an amazing leather fragrance. If you love Derby and you just can't pay the type of prices that Derby is going for, if you ever see Wheel Pour Homme at a great price, grab it. It is, I think it's at the father of Derby. Because this came out in 1980. Derby came out in 85. And, Je and Jean-Paul Guerlain started working on Derby and Coriolan apparently around 1980. So right around this time. Um, I think this was influential. It's, it's discontinued. Very few people talk about Wheel Pour Homme. This is one of those that um, 
It's not on that hype train. It's not hype like Derby and stuff like that, but it absolutely deserves it. The way the herbs and there's rosemary in here as well, kind of a throwback. I always think of Paco Rabanne Pour Homme and stuff like that. Clary Sage and Mugwort, Basil, Aldehydes, Petit Grand. So it's this crazy mixture, the Petit Grand and the, and the lemon or the uh, lemon, lime and bergamot and lavender uh, give it this opening kind of freshness. The rosemary makes makes it, of course, traditionally masculine. Sometimes rosemary can come across as somewhat oily to me. And there's a little bit of that here. Uh, car old school spicy carnation, of course. But it's that dry down. It's the leather and the cedar wood and moss, tonka, labdanum, and vetiver. It, it just, you know, it opens up very... Um, the herbs and the leather combine to just give it this derby like feel to me. It's, it's, I think it's, um, I think it is, uh, Wheel's best fragrance along with, uh, Kipling. Kipling is my other favorite from, from the house of Wheel. But, uh, what, what a fragrance they created that no one talks about. Wheel Pour Homme comes in at number six. Number five. And number five is probably the one everyone thought would be number one. And it very well could be. I mean, we're splitting hairs in the top five. I just think that, um, I just think that, you know, I, I couldn't put it any higher than this. I, I wanted to, but I just couldn't. And it is the great Balenciaga's Portos. This actually came from the Duck Den. So Rich Mitch, thank you. Rich Mitch bought this from uh, Muda Seer. Ended up he deciding he didn't like it. And it ended up coming. And I was And I was like, man, I was just about to buy that. Rich beat me to it. As he usually does. Oh my God. Maybe I shouldn't have put this at number five. Oh, oh man. This is so, so good though. Again, splitting hairs on, um, on anything in the top five right now. But this is basically a spicy, leathery, animalic fragrance with a huge hit of castorium. If you know castorium, Al Manzano, this was his signature scent from back in the day. Uh, the castorium is huge in here. I think I prefer the way the Castorium is done in Antaeus a little bit more. Uh, this is maybe even harder to wear than Antaeus. It doesn't have the uh, Chanel sparkle about it. You know, that Chanel always seems so posh. Even when they're doing animalic fragrances, you're wearing a Chanel, right? There's, there's something classy about it. This has kind of this punch in the face. There's this... Uh, you know, there's this roughness to it, this rowdiness to this fragrance. Oh, but just the resins. I mean, uh, coriander and mugwort in the top with cedar, patchouli, geranium, jasmine, and vetiver in the heart. Castorium, leather, frankincense, myrrh, moss, musk, and, and labdanum. Almost like the perfect base. The perfect base for me. Uh, spicy, leathery, animalic, resinous. And you'll, you'll pick up a little bit of that musk too. But here, this is the way they should have done the musk in um, fine cologne. You know, how they overdose this musk and it's not, and it seems unbalanced. They overdose the florals and, and the musk in fine cologne. Here is how they should have done the musk. Mixed it with other animalic notes, in my opinion. So, Portitos easily could be number one. If you ask me tomorrow, it very well may be. Today, number five. Balenciaga's Portos. Number four, and uh, this is also a discontinued fragrance, which it wasn't discontinued just a year or two ago. It's a recent discontinuation. So there's still bottles floating around. I went through an entire 50 ml bottle of this, and I now have um, two more 50 mils. So I, I'm hopefully going to be set for life on this. But uh, this is Oscar de la Renta Pour Louis. And speaking of uh, spicy herbal fragrances, classy. Oh man. So this is the original. This is what it originally looked like when it came out in 1980. Um, you can see they got in the old days, they used to write the batch code in this weird, uh, white ink. I'll show you when we get to the number one spot, because that also has this weird white writing on the bottom. Um, and then this is uh, one of the earlier reformulations from uh, Sanofi. Sanofi Beauty did this reformulation. I think it went uh, the original, and then it went Parfum Stern, 
and then Sanofi. Anything Sanofi and, and before, you're good. Um, and so Oscar de la Renta Pour Louis, one of my, one, could easily be a signature scent for me because it mixes this, um, you know how I said Antaeus has this classiness about it. So does Pour Louis. Yes, there's a little bit of animalics. Yes, there's leather. Uh, yes, there is masculine herbal, you know, opening. You're going to get sage and basil and anise and caraway. It made my anise video that I did recently. Uh, there's a little bit of galbanum in here, but that aldehydic spicy opening is to die for. And the way it dries down, oh. Oh, my God. So that's that's basically how it ended up beating Portitos is um I think Portitos is a fragrance that um you know if you just took these two at 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 its core you would say ah oh, Ram prefers Portitos. And there's many days that I think I do, but I am just almost in awe of the way that a fragrance like Pour Louis can blend animalics and this freshness to it. There's almost like the aldehydes or the geranium. That's the other thing about geranium is geranium can sometimes give off this soapy like quality, uh, this freshness to it. Geranium can feel very fresh to the nose. And in Port Louis, it feels like there's this soapy phase that comes through, which ended up turning into this aquatic phase the next decade. But towards the end of the 80s, you start to see things like Aramis New West, right? And you start to see cool water, which really was aquatic. But, um, you know, and so was New West in some ways. But, you know, the 80s was this, the late 80s ended up being the smell of the, this kind of fresh, not super animalic. Remember, this is before Koros. This is before Antaeus and all that stuff. And so what this, what this does to me, I mean, it is, I mean, like I said, I went through an entire 50 mil. Now I've got two 50 mils left and I am just in love with poor Louis. Such a, oh, what a fragrance, man. What a fragrance. Okay, so that was number uh, four, is Oscar de la Renta pour Louis. Number three, uh, very hard to rank these, very hard, because we're in, we're in the big hitter phase. Um, but number three is what many consider to be uh, the greatest masculine of all time. I uh, think that it's probably way overhyped. Don't pay $1,000 for this. Definitely don't pay $1,000 for this. Some, some, some bottles go for $1,500. do not pay that. Uh, but this is number three. It's from 1980, and it is the great Patu Porom. Okay, so Patu Porom. This is uh, all I have right here. This is it. This is all the juice I have. In my Patu Pour Homme. If you flip it over, you'll notice you'll see Mysore sandalwood. Santal de Mysore. Uh, and yes, it is Santal de Mysore. And you'll notice that there is pimento in here. And yes, there is pimento. Just like I mentioned, um, there was a pimento note that was very brilliantly used in this for Side Pour Homme. And in this, these were both 1980, okay? So this gets all the love. This gets almost no love. Um, but you'll see kind of, you can start to, whenever you smell a lot of fragrances, you start to kind of pick up on trends, okay? That maybe the average person would miss. And in Patu Porom, one thing that you will notice about this fragrance is there's no heavy leather. There's no um, castorium. There's no civet. There's no, you know, there's not even like a giant oak. There's not a huge slab of oak moss like everyone loves from the old days. That's all you get right there. Look at the simplicity. Look at the brilliance of this fragrance that it has clary sage, vetiver, bourbon vetiver, cedar, uh, Virginia cedar, which that's the one that literally smells like pencil shavings. Virginia cedar, I think, is the one that has that pencil shaving like smell. Santal de Mysore, which we talked about, uh, Malabar pepper, and clary sage, and pimento. That's it. Uh, but Jean Carlio is such a brilliant perfumer. And again, this gets compared to Derby. I mean, I see the um, slight comparison to Derby 
in the fact that they're both uh, very classy wares, right? So in an era where stuff like this was coming out, which I absolutely love, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love this, uh, Derby and Patu Porhomme and these type of fragrances were, um, you know, you could also throw uh, Santos de Cartier, which will be in my 1981 video, in the, in the list of fragrances like Derby, like um, Patu Porhomme. Um, they're just, they're, they're more of the classy wear, I would say, more of the professional wear. Um, not that you couldn't wear this to work, because I, I do, I absolutely do, but, uh, if you wanted to, let's say, uh, not put forth such an animalic growl at work, it would be something like this. I, and this is a special occasion fragrance. It's turned into a special occasion fragrance, but it's so, so good. Um... Just that sandalwood note, man. I mean, that Mysore note in here is just spot on perfect. And it's not a super loud fragrance either, but when you wear it, you just, you feel like a million bucks. I mean, Patu Poro makes you feel like a million bucks. Okay, next on the list, we have what many will probably fall out of their chair on. Uh, the fact that I put this above Patu Poro, but I had to be honest with myself. And I think I enjoy wearing this more than Patu Porhomme. This is Leonard Porhomme. So Leonard Porhomme comes in a couple different packagings. You can get it like this or like this. Uh, this is a small packaging. These little 25 mil bottles are brilliant. Fantastic way to add it uh, to your collection on the cheap. And again, this is, oh man. Oh, so this is Ron Winograd at work. Ron Winograd is, to me, one of the most unsung heroes of the perfume-making masculine uh, 70s and 80s. He made Lagerfeld Classic. He made Furio. He made um, Leonard Porhomme. He made Monsieur Leonard, which is on my list. That came out in 1992, but it's more fresher. Um, and he made Roomba by Balenciaga, which ended up being Roomba by... Um, uh, by um, Lapidus later on, but originally it was for Balenciaga. Um, and 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 yeah, I mean, just hit after hit after hit after hit. Lagerfeld, Furio, Leonard, some of my favorite fragrances of all time he made. And there is just something about this, and I, I hardly, hardly hear anyone ever talk good about Leonard. I feel like I'm the only one. I'm the one carrying the flag up, up the hill for Leonard Poron. It, oh, fuck. You know, it's just, it, it does have that castorium leather combo in the base I love with frankincense, and you can, you can smell it. I mean, you're going to get that castorium twang. Sometimes castorium can come across as very, um, I call it the castorium twang, but sometimes some people say castorium can smell um, metallic. And sometimes they can say that it smells very leathery and warm. It adds this warmth to a fragrance, basically, right? Um, but that metallic bit, don't think metallic like um, the metallic fragrances of the 90s, like Platinum Amiga. Don't think about that. This is, um, it's just almost like this castorium twang is the only way I can describe it. When you first spray this, it's going to hit you. And you're going to notice it for sure. Uh, it'll it'll grab you. You know, I was talking about some of these other fragrances not grabbing me. This one just grabbed and never let go. Again, I got many, many bottles of this stuff. Uh, I never want to be without it. And Leonard, as a house, is uh, known to, to use a carrot note. And not a carrot seed note, which can kind of impersonate iris. But a true carrot note in the heart. Now, there is iris in here as well. Uh, and, and that iris leather combination, I've talked about it before, winning combo, hands down winning combination. Uh, one of my favorite spicy animalic leather scents that hardly anyone talks about. Leonard Poem at number two. Number one, this was very hard for me to pick, but I think I have to be honest. I think this is, uh, this made number one on my Dior video, and it's going to make number one on my 79 and 80s video. I can't put anything above it, honestly. The more I've worn this, 
the more I realize what a masterpiece this is. And speaking of masterpiece perfumers that only did a couple fragrances, we talked about Ron Winograd with number two. Number one is Jean Martel. And Jean Martel only made um, Paco Rabanne Pour Homme and this, Jules, by the house of Christian Dior. And I have a backup of this coming at some point from Poland. Um, it's just a matter of arriving, which... Uh, Oh, I can't wait for that haul to arrive. But this, oh God, this is, oh, <laughs> this is uh, a leather of all leathers to, to just die for. I mean, it does have this spiciness to it. There's a little bit of cumin in the top. Uh, it's It feels green, but man, the castorium and the leather in the base of this with the woods, What a perfumer Jean Martel was. How did he only make two fragrances? Fuck. Oh, man. I am in love with this stuff. Absolute love. And you know what? It's one of these that's grown on me. Let me show you what I was talking about with those um, white writing letters underneath. See how they used to do it back in the day? Um, so this is the original original Oscar de la Renta pour Louis. See that old school white writing? Um, yeah, just, uh, I, I am so glad to have, and it's actually this exact bottle. This is the bottle. This is the backup that's coming. Uh, and I am over the moon to have more of this stuff. I never want to be without it. Jules, uh, the more I wear it, the more I realize just what What an absolute masterpiece this is. Um, they tried to re-release it a couple years ago under a new bottle. It says it's still available for purchase. It's a completely different fragrance from what I hear. Someone told me that um, the new version, even though it's a completely different fragrance, is still good. I've never smelled the new one, but uh, I can tell you this is the one you have to get if you want this version that I'm talking about. The, the new one is apparently different from what I hear. But if you're a spicy leather lover, if you love leather like I do, this is almost like uh, castorium leather suede. It's almost like this leathery suede. Oh, man. I have no clue how I'm going to review this. Like, how am I going to review something this complex? I don't know if I even have the words to describe this. Um, so, Dior Jure. Comes in at number one for me on my 1979-1980 list. Thanks for watching, everyone. We kept it under two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. An hour and a half. Although I probably could have rambled on for two and a half hours with all of these loves on one table for me. Uh, missed missed you guys yesterday. I hope uh, I hope to do some live streams very soon where we test out some new stuff. I have a lot of stuff that I want to test with you guys. Um, so a lot of content coming. Do like and subscribe, and all the stuff I'm supposed to say as a YouTuber, which I uh, uh, have gotten better at remembering, but, uh, you know, it does help the algorithm, which gets it out to more fragrance lovers who want to be in our little fragrance town. Um, so, yes, thanks for watching, everybody. Cheers. I look forward to reading your comments below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what your favorites are, and let me know if there's some from, the se from 79 and 80 that got left off the list. Like, for example, Worth Pour Homme. I don't have a bottle. Uh, Eau de Monsieur by Goutal, don't have a bottle. So there's definitely some room to grow in 79 and 80, but let me know what some of your favorites are. Cheers, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye now.